stargazing scientists at NASA are confident that within the next few decades, humans will discover the very first signs of extraterrestrial life. Yet some believe it's entirely possible alien craft have already visited Earth. <laughs> Large black flying object. Hey, hey, calm down, calm down. But extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. In this series, I'm going to investigate some of the most remarkable and recent UFO sightings from around the world. They saw something really strange in the sky that day. And I'll be joined by renowned astrophysicist and space journalist, Sarah Crudders. The thing is, with something so extraordinary like this, we've got to look at all the more logical explanations. I still think this can be explained by science. As together, we'll separate fact from fiction once and for all. That is an unidentified flying object. I knew you were going to say that, and, and yes, it is. It's one of the greatest UFO mysteries of all time. From our specially created UFO investigation hub, We'll speak to experts. We have no conventional explanation for what we are seeing here. Whistleblowers. Anytime you step out of ranks uh, in an organization like mine, there's obviously going to be some repercussions. And first hand witnesses. There was this massive boomerang. It's at least a mile to a mile and a half wide. It was huge. Wow, that's just spooked me now. And finally, answer the big question. Are we alone in the universe? Whatever they are, they're not of this world. Twenty-five years ago, in the night skies of Phoenix, Arizona, the most spectacular mass UFO sighting ever recorded took place. A series of spectacular light formations silently crossed over densely populated cities. This remarkable event was witnessed by thousands of people, making this mass UFO sighting one of the biggest unsolved mysteries of the modern age. The Phoenix Light Encounter is not the first mass UFO sighting in history. On the 27th of October, 1954, in broad daylight, a football game in Florence, Italy, ground to a halt when a UFO began to perform acrobatics in the sky. 52 years later, on the 7th of November, 2006, another mass sighting at Chicago O'Hare Airport. A saucer-shaped UFO appeared to hover over gate C-17 for at least five minutes before shooting upward, punching a circular-shaped hole in the clouds. Uh, we saw it a half hour ago. We saw it. A whole bunch of us over at the uh, Charlie Gang And two years later, in Stephenville, Texas, a mile-wide craft, a mothership, witnessed by at least 50 residents who all tell exactly the same story. It wasn't anything that I'd seen before. We all looked at each other. I, I just asked, are y'all looking, are y'all seeing what I'm seeing? But as mass sightings go, nothing compares to the sheer scale and drama of the still unexplained Phoenix lights that appeared in the night sky 25 years ago. Could these have been extraterrestrial craft? We'll scrutinize every detail of this incredible event to get to the truth. On the evening of March the 13th, 1997, as millions of Arizona residents settled in for an ordinary Thursday night, none of them could have predicted how extraordinary it would turn out to be. At around 7 p.m., the first report that something strange was happening in the night sky came in from a retired police officer. The officer reported a series of peculiar reddish lights arranged in a V formation. Another witness filmed the moment the lights passed silently overhead. Over the next 48 hours, calls rained into authorities. Multiple sightings of bizarre light formations moving slowly over the city. Boomerangs, chevrons, even a cube. It is evidence of something unknown. Could it be extraterrestrial? I can't rule it out.
I'm really excited about this one, Sarah. This is a mass sighting. This isn't just a mass sighting. This is the largest mass sighting in history and one of the top UFO cases ever. And it's seen over three hours, over 300 miles. It started at Nevada Line, went all the way through to Tucson. So, surely, we've got a chance of proving this. Well, what I find interesting about this as well is that the US Air Force actually came out in an unprecedented move a few days after the incident in 1997, and they said it was them dropping flares from a warthog. But no one's convinced. No one has bought that. Whatever these mysterious lights were, we know they tracked north to south over the city of Phoenix, while witnesses filmed the spectacle on their home cameras. And we have some of that footage. So let's just have a look at some of the video evidence and see what you think. So you've got multiple lights, almost like orb-shaped objects. Yeah. Um, and this is Phoenix. This is a huge city in Arizona. Yeah. They seem quite large, don't they? Well, we can't tell scale because we don't know how far away they are, but you've got these bright objects and a lot of people are witnessing this. And they seem a lot bigger than aircraft lights. Wow, so there's one, two, five lights. They do look like something that could be flying in formation, don't they? They do, they do, and it's flying... It's difficult to... Oh, there's another, another one. Another one? Imagine seeing that, mm. going outside and your neighbours are all seeing it as well. It, it, it's quite an eerie thing to witness in the night sky. It's quite shocking. Hang on, one of them's disappeared as well. One of them just gone, yeah. Another one gone. Another one gone. Well, the American Air Force have said they dropped flares. We've got to consider that account as well because they might not be looking like they're behaving like flares, but then we don't know what the weather conditions were like. We don't know what the wind direction was like that day. It could be our first close encounter. It is. It's compelling footage. It's got my attention. With most of the cases to hit our desk, there's a shortage of direct evidence. But in the case of the Phoenix Lights, we've almost got an overabundance. This is a good problem to have. We've got so many witnesses to choose from. And I think the first person you need to speak to, Craig, is David Parker. He was one of many who had a first-hand account of what happened in Phoenix back in 1997. Of the thousands of eyewitnesses, David Parker was one of only a few who got a close-up look at the craft. And it's only recently he's decided to go public with his story. You are an eyewitness. Can you tell me what happened to you that night? Um, I was a hospice nurse, and I was working 12-hour shifts on day shift. Uh, when I was driving back to my home in Phoenix, as I looked out, of my window, there was this massive boomerang. Huge boomerang. So I slammed on my brakes. I jumped out of my truck as the craft was, was coming very close. There's this massive, massive craft. It took up most of the sky. And I would say it was at least a mile to a mile and a half wide. I was about 30 feet underneath the left wing. It was like a gunmetal gray. It was covered with like thumbprints, um, indentations, you know, like the holes in a golf ball, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Uh, there was probably, what, six or eight lights, but I was just focused on the one that was closest to me. It was a huge hole in the bottom of the craft. And out of that poured what looked exactly like lava. Wow, that's just spooked me now. Uh, you d describe it so vividly. There were, the hairs were standing up on my arms. I can still see it. I can still see the glow of that stuff. Was this just one incident, David? Evidently, other people saw other things um, before and after. This was the only thing that I saw. For you to see so much, 
the aircraft must have been traveling very, very slowly. It was, it was just like taking its time. It was like meandering right across the sky. As it started, you know, drifting out of sight, I just was overcome with this feeling of gratitude. I, I felt like I had just won the lottery. And I just stood there bawling my eyes out. So what do you say to people who say that was, that was just, it was just the Air Force dropping flares? Well, the Air Force came out and said it was flares. That was not a flare. That was a piece of machinery, massive. But what is it that you think you saw? I think I saw a craft from something elsewhere than this planet. I want to know who was inside that craft. I have so many more questions than I do answers. We're going to try and get to the bottom of this, David. I, I can't explain it. it it's genuinely interesting. It, it's genuinely something I've never heard of before. We do need to investigate this. We certainly do. Let's find out more. Coming up. I had over 600 phone calls, and they all saw this vehicle. Former councilwoman Frances Barwood reveals a dark campaign designed to silence the people of Phoenix. They put signs in the hall of the city council with my picture saying, talk into the tin foil and she will hear you. We're talking about shadowy forces that are more powerful than governments. On a cool night in March 1997, one of the most famous UFO mysteries of all time played out before the eyes of thousands. Holy cow. What is it? A close encounter of epic proportions, as waves of highly structured coloured lights move silently across the cities of Phoenix and Tucson in Arizona. It took up most of the sky. And I would say it was at least a mile to a mile and a half wide. It was huge. Despite the scale of the incident, initially there was minimal news coverage. But the Arizona governor, Fife Symington, himself a pilot and former United States Air Force captain, did call a press conference. I issued a call for an investigation by the Arizona Department of Public Safety the governor told a gathered press, TV and radio crews that he'd ordered an investigation into the sighting. Our Department of Public Safety is one of the best, and their investigator's swift action in this case is proof. Only to then make fun of the incident and all those who had reported it and claimed to have seen it. The break in the case came about two hours ago. Officers working undercover raided a home where evidence important to this case was discovered. The occupant was taken into custody. Now I'll ask Officer Stein and his colleagues to escort the accused into the room so that we may all look upon the guilty party. And this just goes to show that you guys are entirely too serious. Inside the costume was the governor's chief of staff. <laughs> And in a heartbeat, thousands of witnesses were ridiculed and discredited. Witnesses like David Parker. So the governor mocked the incident? Absolutely. And discredited the whole thing as a joke. And, uh, and my coworkers then finally started laughing at me. Oh, there's what you saw. It's the man in a rubber suit. And uh, that's when I just quit talking. Witnesses who saw the UFO with their own eyes believe the governor's stunt was a false flag operation designed to divert attention. And Governor Symington later admitted as much in a primetime interview in which having left office, he performed a stunning U-turn. What did you see? Well, I saw a, uh, a huge craft just kind of 
come right over. Unquestionably, it was a UFO. Right. Doesn't nothing, mean we're being visited. Well, it's nothing like anything I've ever seen. Do you believe it was something from the U.S. government? No, this, this was totally different. I think this was technologically far advanced. This is something from another world, you know. Is that what and I think, I, I really believe, I believe that. Symington not only confessed to having seen the lights himself, but that he believed it was an extraterrestrial craft. He's quoted as saying issues like this go up the chain of command all the way to the Pentagon. And that the Air Force's explanation that the UFOs were flares was total bunk. Throughout history, at least modern history, we've seen accounts being ridiculed, disinformation campaigns, particularly with the US government. They don't want people talking about these sightings. They don't want people coming forward. Now, does that mean it's military technology they're testing, or is there something else there? But when you hear David Parker describe that mile and a half long craft, I mean, surely that is a danger to American citizens. That should have fighter jets all around it. We don't know what it was, but what we do know is that there is someone who is in government who stood up for all those people who felt like they were silenced. And that woman is Councilwoman Frances Barwood. Hi, Councillor Barwood. Good morning. At the time of the 1997 Phoenix Light sightings, Frances Barwood was councilwoman and vice mayor for the city of Phoenix. And in the days that followed, concerned citizens turned to her for help. I didn't see it, but I had over 600 phone calls and they all saw this you know, vehicle passing over and they watched it as it went south. When I brought it up at the council meeting, everybody just turned and looked at me and it was like, wow, um, why, why do they not say anything? They put signs in the hall of the city council, you know, um, with my picture saying, talk into the tin foil and she will hear you. And, you know, so they ridiculed me quite a bit. Why do you think, Councillor, the Phoenix Council was so reluctant to investigate this matter? I found out later that somebody told all of them except me, do not talk about this. What are they so afraid of? Why don't they want to know whatever it was? So I did send a letter to Senator McCain. Uh, didn't get an answer, sent another one. Uh, found out that he sent it to the National Archives, which we consider the national trash can. So I kept getting kind of blocked. Undeterred, Francis then decided to contact the US military, and they had a surprising explanation. When I tried to talk to uh, the military, they told me, oh, that was just, uh, they were sending up flares. Well, flares don't travel horizontally for over two hours and, and for hundreds of miles. That's interesting. If it was a spaceship, um, Councillor, how come you haven't got the American military, the Air Force there, flanking it with, with fighter jets? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous place to be flying over you know, downtown Phoenix, and yet no military presence whatsoever. Well, there, there were. And the truckers that were going south uh, testified that they saw military planes going after it. Circulating online is apparently leaked footage which appears to show military planes engaging unknown craft in the sky above the southern states. On exactly the same night, March 13th, 1997. If it's genuine, then the military may know more than they're prepared to share. Would you accept an explanation that this wasn't aliens, that this was actually military technology or something more down to earth? Well, and, and I thought of that except 
that I know some military people who said that that was not ours and they were all um, warned that they couldn't talk about it. My dad said long time ago, he was the chief investigator for the city of New York. So he saw a lot of stuff. And he said, there's the government you see and then there's the government you don't see. And that's the one you got to worry about. I'm, I think it's very compelling. It's one of the most compelling cases we've had so far. But it, it could still be military. It could still be weather. I mean, the National no, Guard... Listen to the councilwoman. Thousands of people phoned her up saying, we've just saw... Look, I think it's exciting, but I think we also have to have an open mind with this and be prepared that this could be earthly technology. Do you think you'll ever give up, councillor, trying to get to the bottom of what happened? I, I think there's people out there that do know. And it's, um, it's frustrating because, you know, the public, they really wanted an answer. It's, it's kind of sad that people are afraid to speak out. Councillor, thank you. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Well, there you go, Sarah. They're talking about shadowy forces that are more powerful than governments. We've got to have all the evidence, and we haven't got that. We've got some strong evidence, but not enough. Coming up. OK, I, I, I'm, I'm not sold. Sarah and I battle it out over the official military explanation that the Phoenix lights were flares. This is actual evidence. That doesn't explain David Parker uh, saying that he saw a massive, mile-wide spaceship flying over his head. This was a really spectacular, high-altitude display. And ex-MOD man Nick Pope breaks cover on another major UFO-like phenomenon in Norway. There was even speculation that it had messed with the fabric of time and space and reality itself. The sheer scale of the Phoenix light sighting is beyond compare. Three hours in duration, two vast formations of intensely bright lights in the night sky. It's a mass sighting with plenty of evidence, plenty of witnesses. So far, we've established a V-shaped UFO traveled at slow speed from north to south across the state of Arizona on the evening of the 13th of March, 1997. Eyewitness reports and an unverified leaked video suggest the military may have been in pursuit. But in the weeks following this extraordinary encounter, what appears to be a carefully orchestrated disinformation campaign by the authorities shamed the city into silence. I'm almost embarrassed that I allowed uh, uh, Governor Symington having that person in a rubber suit humiliate me to the point of shutting my mouth. We're on a mission to try and get answers for those Phoenix residents who were silenced 25 years ago. And scientist Sarah believes the key to cracking this case could lie in the hard data. Craig, I know how excited you are about this, but I've got some evidence that might convince you. And look, here's the weather chart mm -hmm. from the day, and this says the weather was actually blowing towards the east and then swung towards the south, which is actually the direction those lights travelled in. The official military line was the lights were pyrotechnic flares deployed by an A-10 Warthog fighter-bomber aircraft. These military flares produce a bright light some attached to small parachutes designed to extend the time they can remain airborne. Their direction of travel relies entirely on the prevailing wind. And Sarah's research into the wind direction on March 13th, 1997, confirms this hypothesis. And she's uncovered more crucial evidence about military activity in the area at the time. The Maryland National Guard have come forward and there's a statement from them and they said shortly after the incident that they were actually on a training flight. So that explains the V formation. Then they simply drop flares. The wind direction explains the direction of travel of those flares. 
But former councilwoman Frances Barwood has a problem with flare theory. Well, flares don't travel horizontally for over two hours and, and for hundreds of miles. The maximum burn time of any known flare is 90 minutes. Eyewitness reports of the Phoenix light suggest they were visible for over three hours. Francis isn't convinced by this, nor am I. OK, I, I, I'm, I'm not sold. This is actual evidence okay. from but, the military and from science. From but that, do, I mean, that, that doesn't explain uh, David Parker uh, saying that he saw a massive, mile-wide spaceship flying over his head, so close that he could see its inner workings. But do you not maybe think he was influenced by all these stories in the media and it's just become something that it isn't? I think he saw this thing. That was not a flare. That was not a flare. It was a piece of machinery. Massive. And then there's Councillor Barwood and her pointing to a conspiracy uh, to hush this up. My dad was chief investigator for the city of New York, and he said, never let anything go unfinished. You have to find the answer. That's interesting, but she also mentioned her father, who was a New York investigator. So this is something in her DNA. So maybe she's just trying to fulfill his work. How much evidence do you need? That's all I'm saying. Well, you need a huge amount of evidence. What I can tell you, Craig, is that this incident in Phoenix isn't unique. There was something similar that happened in Norway, and I spoke to Nick Pope, our MOD investigator and UFO expert, about it. Can you just talk us through this incident in Norway? Yeah, this was a really spectacular high-altitude display. We see this, this strange spiral pattern forming in the sky. And it almost looks as if, I don't know, waves are, are, are coming out from a, a central focal point. What was really interesting about it, I think, was all the bizarre theories that started doing the rounds. People said uh, that it was aliens kind of making some sort of display of their power. There were theories about portals opening up, dimensional portals. There was even speculation that it might have something to do with things going on at the Large Hadron Collider, that somehow this has messed with the fabric of, of time and space and reality itself. But was there a more earthly explanation to what we saw? There was. And it's those Russians. Turns out that the Russian Defense Ministry confirmed that at exactly that time and, and in a situation where that's exactly where it would have been visible, uh, there was a missile test and the missile malfunctioned. Not everyone believed it, of course. People say, oh, it's just a cover story. It's, you know, they're trying to cover up aliens. But to me, I think this was a pretty clear cut explanation. And this case in Norway is, of course, more than a decade old. Do you think it's still important that people report unusual things in this guy so that people aren't stigmatized if they come forward? It's really important that we don't end up stigmatizing the witnesses. This was something genuinely very rare. So I don't, I don't blame people who looked up into the sky and, and said, wow. None of this means that people are stupid. It means that they're seeing things that they don't normally see. Do you think the fact that we've been able to explain these lights in the night sky, but the Phoenix lights incident still more than two decades on remains a mystery, do you think this just adds more credibility to what happened in Phoenix? Just because we've explained one strange light in the sky doesn't mean that we've automatically explained all the others. It always um, pays to look at this holistically and, and never uh, focus in on just single element of a case. So consider the witnesses, consider their backgrounds, their education, their experience, consider the photos and the videos. I always say, take, it, take a look at everything. 
Russian rockets may explain the Norway spiral, but that doesn't mean the Phoenix Lights have been magically explained. The lesson of the Norwegian spiral is that if something seems beyond our imagination, it doesn't necessarily mean it's extraterrestrial. Now we need to take what we've learned and apply it to the Phoenix Lights. Okay, so listen to what Nick said. He said, look at it holistically. Uh, consider the witnesses. I mean, these are credible witnesses, nurses, doctors, thousands of people. Now, if you were on tri at trial and thousands of people say they saw you do it, then you'd be found guilty. But this isn't a legal investigation. This is a scientific investigation, and we need data and we need facts, and we haven't got enough so far with the Phoenix Lights. Okay, so where do we go next? We follow the evidence. We need to speak to someone else, someone who is at the heart of this story. Coming up. She's got a lot of documentation, and she's got photographs here from 98, 2000, 2001, 2013. Eyewitness Dr. Lynn Keetai presents game-changing photographic evidence. That's three orbs really close up, that one. Wow, there's detail on these as well. I actually captured the same mile-wide phenomena head-on, turning it into a V-shape two months before the mass sighting. And we face the reality that the Phoenix Lights case is bigger than we could ever have imagined. The truth of it is, is there were many sightings of these ore formations as well as different craft. The Phoenix Lights is the most spectacular and mysterious of all officially recorded UFO encounters. But where those glowing amber orbs that lace the sky, that's three orbs really close up, that one. Wow, there's detail on these as well. Moving in formation across the state of Arizona on the evening of the 13th of March, 1997. Extraterrestrial or not? So far, we've looked at the attempts of those in power to silence witnesses through ridicule. So the governor mocked the incident? Absolutely and discredited the whole thing as a joke. And how the US military tried to explain away the incident by claiming that what people saw were flares dropped in a military training exercise. But not everyone is convinced. Well, flares don't travel horizontally for over two hours and, and for hundreds of miles. Uncovering the truth, relies on the very personal testimony of the people who witnessed the event with their own eyes. Now, Sarah, there's no doubt that I've found that the anecdotal evidence of David Parker and Councillor Barwood to be very, very compelling. Plus the eyewitness accounts of thousands of people who say that they saw unusual objects in the night sky. That's not enough for you, is it? No, it's not. And with something like this, something so extraordinary, we need to follow the evidence. So I've got someone who could help us with that investigation. Her name is Dr Lynn Keetai. She's a former medical doctor. She was a skeptic before she actually witnessed the Phoenix Lights in 1997, and she's now made it her life's work to try and solve this mystery. Hi, Doctor. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for talking to us. From her home in Phoenix, Dr. Keetai not only saw and filmed the 97 sightings, but claims she has evidence that proves the Phoenix Lights UFO event is just the tip of the iceberg. There is much more to the story of the Phoenix Lights than just March 13, 1997. Lynn has photographic proof the UFO visited Phoenix a full two years earlier. My husband, who's also a physician, saw outside our bedroom window in 1995, three amber orbs in a pyramid formation, one on top and two closely aligned underneath. It was an incredible experience. Two years later, I actually captured the same over mile wide phenomena head on, turning it into a V-shape two months before the mass sighting. Desperate for answers as to what the strange lights might be, Lynn put her medical career on hold 
and began her own investigation. I called around, found air traffic controllers at Sky Harbor International Airport who saw the same thing at the same time. Anyone that comes into that airspace must call into the tower, and no one did. So they took their high-powered binoculars to look, and in their own words, saw six points of light totally equidistant from each other. Massive span over a mile wide that seemed to be attached to something. And the entire thing turned against the wind. So I said, so what was it? And there was silence. They could not find an answer for what this phenomenon was. Lynn continued to document these anomalous lights right up to the 13th of March, 1997, and the evening of the main sighting. So when these lights arrived, she watched closely, along with the rest of the city. Lights seemed to be gliding at rooftop level, totally silent. Some people saw it take off at blink speed. Other people saw these orbs detach from the main object, go out into the environment, and then redock with it later. Thousands of people saw this right over their heads, and there was no investigation, no explanation. And what Dr. Keitai discovered about the main sighting on March 13th, 1997, is startling. The US Air Force was in the air that night, but it wasn't their aircraft that were responsible for the Phoenix Lights. There was a call to the National UFO Reporting Center at 3 a.m. the following morning from an alleged crewman, very professional. A recording was taken of his entire report, and he stated that the military, Luke Air Force Base, sent off jets to intercept and get gun camera film of one of these massive craft hovering right over central Phoenix. As they got close, the lights started to dim and the entire thing blinked out. I mean, incredible technology to be sure that we have not seen and it's time we get this topic out in the open. Address it, accept it, so we can find out not only who's driving these things, but also move forward in our own evolution. But just because we don't have the technology yet to define what these things are, it doesn't mean they're not real. Dr. Lynn, thank you for talking to us. My pleasure, keep looking up. Sir, if you weren't convinced then, are you now? She's got a lot to say, and she's got a lot of documentation. Now, these photographs were taken from 1995, two years before the 1997 event, and she's got photographs here from 98, 2000, 2001, 2013. I mean, these are spectacular shots. That's three orbs really close up, that one. Wow, there's detail on these as well. These are incredible. And they're, they're so sort of well documented. I mean, something must be going on. The Phoenix Lights was the big event, but what we've actually got is multiple sightings, sightings which happened in the years prior, mm. and then going on for decades And afterwards. years since. The Phoenix Lights case began as one of the biggest and most well documented UFO cases we've had in the hub. Now, it's on an epic scale. But soon we must come to a decision. Is the Phoenix Lights phenomenon extraterrestrial or not? OK, let's look at the evidence now and okay. look at what we've got. We know that at between 7.30 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. on March 13th, 1997, under a clear sky with a light breeze, an apparently massive triangular-shaped craft passed over the state of Arizona in plain view of thousands of witnesses. We've got the, the nurse, David Parker, who gave a brilliantly described emotive description of an aircraft flying 30 feet above his head, so close that he could see the inner markings. You've got Councillor Barwood, who then had her career destroyed by people above trying to suppress this. And as for the conventional explanation that the lights were military flares dropped on the training exercise, our researchers uncovered a flaw in that theory. 
the maximum burn time of any known military flare is 90 minutes. The sightings went on for hours. Then we have Dr. Kitai's incredible video and photographic evidence, not just showing light on the 13th of March 1997, but in the years before and after. I actually captured the same over mile wide phenomena head on, turning it into a V shape two months before the mass sighting. It's so much bigger. It's time to reach a final verdict. Some of the evidence is so compelling. You've got first hand accounts from the nurse. That's David. good, yeah. I mean, that was such an emotive, such a well described piece of evidence. There's this massive, massive craft. It took up most of the sky. It was at least a mile to a mile and a half wide. It was huge. This flew 30 feet over his head. He could see the, the inner workings of it. I think he saw what he thinks he saw. That is certainly a powerful account, but what I will say is interesting, what I will give you, is this disinformation campaign from the governor. And as you turn, even he now thinks it was alien. I'm not going to say this is case not proven. I'm going to say the jury's out. I am going to say, yes, we've got a mass sighting. Yes, we've got people who believe they see, have seen something that they can't explain. I, I think it's, it is a mystery. There's a lot of people who want to believe. And even though there is this valid explanation, I'm going to oh, hate myself for doing this. I'm going to agree with you that the jury's out. The jury's out. You agree with me? I know. High five. <laughs> The Phoenix Lights joins the ranks of thousands of other UFO sightings that cannot be fully explained by science or conventional theories. The possibility the lights were extraterrestrial continues to hover over this extraordinary case. What is certain is that whatever passed silently over the city that night, it has opened minds and raised new possibilities that we are not alone. A former lawyer takes up one last case after her brother is accused of murder. The new Spanish drama, Anna, All In. Stream free on SBS On Demand.